Oh my good God. This lecture never got recorded. Okay. So, all right. So, now when I perform back propagation, then here's what we'd have. We'd have the, have the output at the uh, final input. There's going to be the desired output at the final input. And you can compute the derivative or you can compute the divergence between these two at the final input and the derivatives of these divergences of this divergence can be back propagated. But then when you do this, you are uh, ignoring something useful. The network is actually producing outputs at these other times too. We are just pretending that there has been no output. And so you're ignoring these outputs. And that doesn't make a lot of sense. Now consider the consider you know the speech recognition problem. If I'm saying ah, you're certain that the sound is ah at the final input, but at the other times, is the as the is the phoneme any different? If I'm just saying ah, what would the labels at these times be? Anyone? What would they be? Same. They would have, they would be the same, right? So we are ignoring them. So what we would we could actually do is to just assume that the same label also applies at these outputs. And if I make that assumption, now although the output is only being produced at the final input, as far as training the model is concerned, I could get additional divergences from the, at the other times. And now this has been reduced to the well-known problem of how, where we had one output for every input. And so the overall divergence can be thought of as the sum of the divergences at these individual times. I've shown it as a weighted sum over here because uh, you can't make this assumption in every case. For example, in speech recognition, it makes sense to assume that the correct label must be the the true label must be the actual phoneme at every time. But then uh, in the case of question answering, it doesn't make any sense to say that the label must be blue at these other times as well. That it, the uh, Q to blue only came from the last word. So when I think of it as a weighted sum, then in the speech recognition problem, I'm going to have uh, equal contributions from all of these divergences. So the weights would be one at all times. For something like question answering, I can still think of it as a weighted sum, except that the weight is one at the final input and zero elsewhere. Again, the point is that I can smear the label across the input and now reduce it to a well-known problem. There's one output for every input. And now I can use this overall divergence to train the network. With that said, now let's go to the more complex problem, which is this guy here, where you have intermittent outputs. So here, the object of this again, I'm going to uh, use speech recognition as my example. You'd have a sequence of inputs and we would intermittently produce some outputs. So for example, if I'm, uh, if the if the input is the word but, then you would expect to output the label ber when the sound ber ended, to output the label er when the sound er ended, and the label ter when the sound t ended. But this simple extension where I am outputting uh, generating outputs intermittently complicates matters. Now observe that this model over here is exactly the same as this model to the left, except that have several of these concatenated one after the other. And this makes things difficult. Why? Because during inference, the network is actually producing an output at every time. 
but we have to figure out when the label must actually be read. So here in this example, your gender, you have outputs at every one of these time instants. And we have to figure out that this is where I must read a label bar. This is where I must read the label up. And this is where I must read the label top. And this information is generally not provided. So if I want to do this, how can I uh, deal with this issue? For this, we have to first consider what the network actually produces. The network, remember, is uh, generally produce, producing soft outputs. We use softmax layers. And if you have a vocabulary of phonemes at each time, the network is actually producing the probabilities for all of the phonemes. And so at each time, the network would be outputting a vector of probabilities for all the phonemes. But specifically, what are these probabilities? Let's consider the network's output at time four. The network is producing outputting probabilities for all the phonemes, but what it is actually outputting is the probabilities of all of these phonemes given the input. Specifically at time four, it's producing the probabilities of the phonemes given inputs x0 through x4 because this entire sequence has been processed through this recurrence before it generated this output. So at each time, the actual output is the conditional probability of the phonemes given all inputs, the sequence of inputs until that time. Now, in a neural network with a softmax output, this is always the case. We always output the conditional probability of the classes given the input. And when we perform classification, we would choose one of these classes. And which class would we choose given the probabilities that the network is computed? Typically, which class do we choose? Anyone? The highest probability. The class with the highest probability, right? So you're going to pick the class I for which the probability of the class given the input is maximum, right? We're going to use the same principle over here. Now, we're going to use, although the network is outputting probabilities for all the phonemes at each time, what we really want to output is something like this, right? The, the sequence b uh, and t. And note that this sequence is shorter than the input. In the setting where the outputs are intermittent, the sequence of outputs is always at most as long as the input and is generally shorter. And we really want to find out what the optimal sequence of outputs is. And so in this setting, Going back to our maximum a posteriori classification uh, framework, we want to find the sequence of symbols such that the probability of the sequence of symbols given the entire input sequence is maximum. So over here, I can produce any number of symbol sequences because I can have any phoneme at each time uh, and I and the phonemes could have been output at any time, right? So the number of possible sequences here is very large, and you're going to have to pick the most likely sequence from this set of sequences. Does that make sense, guys? Or should I explain that? Yes or no? Okay. Thank you. So again, what we are really trying to do is generate an output sequence of this kind, right? Now here, we don't know how many symbols are going to be output. And we don't know what symbols are going to be output and we don't know when. That is the entire ambiguity, ambiguity over here. This is much more complex than simply finding the uh, 
uh, the most likely class at each time because we want to find the sequence of outputs. Did that make, that make sense? And so, and so what we want to do actually do here is find the sequence of outputs that has the highest probability given the input sequence. Keeping in mind that this output sequence could be of any length, provided it's no longer than the input itself. And that becomes really challenging. So we can have, we can come up with some greedy solutions. And the simplest greedy solution is for me to say, uh, at each time, I'm simply going to pick the most likely symbol. Uh, so Ankush, we'll get to that. We'll, we'll get to that in a few seconds, right? What is the probability of, say, this sequence over here? What would it be, Ankush? It's going to be the product of all of these probabilities, right? Yes. So you'll be multiplying things. So one simple solution here is to simply pick the most likely symbol at each time. And then I can just merge them. I got two Gs in a row. So I can assume that the sound G must be output when this sequence ends. I got four furs in a row. So the sound fur must be output when this sequence ends. I got two E's in a row. So you know E must be output here. I just got a single D. So D must be output here. And what would be the problem of a setting of this kind? What would be the issue here? If I use, if I just use this greedy algorithm. Anybody? So we're assuming that phonemes cannot be repeated, right? We cannot distinguish distinguish between two Fs over here and a single F if I'm simply merging things. And so this is not a great solution. We'll get back to this in the next class. Uh, Professor, yeah. how do we know that the G is not continuing in timestamp two? How do we know that it's ended at timestamp one? So this was my greedy algorithm, right? That I just picked the most likely one at each time. Mm -hmm. So but, this... Sorry. Go ahead. No, in order to predict that uh, something like this uh, output G at X1, we will have to know what the probabilities are at X2, right? Before we can predict the outcome at X1 then. So this is just a greedy solution at this point, right? I'm just suggesting one. Okay. And, and even before you find out other issues, I'm telling you that, you know, there's a simple issue of repetition. Okay. You can't even distinguish this, right? Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, another way to do it is to impose external constraints. And uh, wait a minute. Okay. I'm having issues with this. Okay. Like only allowing sequences corresponding to dictionary words. So you're not going to get some nonsense over here. You can use special null tokens to separate repetitions. Uh, we'll, see, we'll see how we can do these in the next class. But then for, for now, We've just suggested one not very great algorithm for finding the uh, token sequence, right? The symbol sequence. And we're going to refer to this process of obtaining an output from the network as decoding. Now, this over here, as you guys have just pointed out, is in fact a suboptimal decoding strategy. And what it does is actually finds the most likely time synchronous output sequence, meaning you're finding one symbol per time, right? So the output sequence you found is time synchronous. You're getting one output for every time, and then you're merging them. So if you that's the kind of output you wanted, this is in fact the best thing, the most likely time synchronous sequence. But then the most likely time synchronous sequence doesn't necessarily map to the most likely symbol sequence, as we will see. Now, but let's hang on to this thought for a bit, right? That we have some kind of a, a semi-useful mechanism for actually performing inference 
there may be better methods. But for now, let's go on to the more interesting problem. How do we train these models? Now, again, the model must be trained to generate outputs intermittently. Now, so, so the training data you're going to get is going to be something of this kind. You're going to get a sequence of inputs and you're going to get the sequence of outputs. Now, in the ideal case, the training data will actually tell you where each symbol must be output. So it will tell you that the, the, the symbol B must be output at time two. The symbol R must be output at time six. The symbol T must be output at time nine. If this information is given, then training is simple. And this business, this information which tells you exactly at, at, at what time each of these symbols is output is what we will call alignment. So uh, when I inform you that the, uh, some, the sound b, b must be output at time three, r must be output at seven, term must be output at nine, what I have actually given you is an alignment of the word but against the input. And the same word but can be aligned against the input in multiple ways. For example, I might have the but being produced at one, R ending at six, and turn ending at nine, or B ending at two, R ending at five, and turn ending at nine, right? So there can be many different alignments of the same output to the input. And each alignment will result in the symbols being output at different times. So if all I gave you was but, then I wouldn't actually know where to, and didn't tell you where these individual units must be output. I just told you, here's the input, x0 through x9, and the output sequence is b uh, and ta. Then this information is missing. Where must b be output? Where must r be output? And where must ta be output? So the alignment is missing. Now, so did, did this make sense? Did this portion make sense, guys? Okay. So now assuming that we actually have the alignment on the training data, we actually have the alignment of the output with the input. So we know exactly where each output must be produced. In this case, it's very simple. Training would be very simple. We could just compute the divergences at the individual times where those uh, symbols must be generated and uh, add them up. And that would be the divergence we'd minimize. Or using what we just saw earlier, instead of wasting all of these other time instances where there is no, the output is not being considered, we can sort of smear this label across the entire span corresponding to that label and say, the label bur must be applied to all of these locations, all of these time instants. The label r must be applied to all of these time instants. The label ter must be applied to all of these time instants. And now we can compute, a, uh, 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 now we've converted this to a uh, synchronous problem where we have an output and a desired output at each time. We can just, compute the overall callback libler divergence, divergences over this expanded uh, label sequence, which will give me a sum of KL divergences at each time. And that divergence, the derivative of that divergence can now be back propagated. So did this make sense, guys? If I have the alignment, then this is what I could do. Did that make sense? So in in this, are we uh, computing like uh, in a regular time series, we average the gradient of the divergence for all the inputs would be averaging the gradient of each of these labels divergence separately. So the point is, again, when you're back propagating, you're going to be back propagating just the derivative of the divergences 
So remember, you're going to be ag aggregating divergences across all the inputs, right? And so uh, the overall divergence is going to be the sum of the divergences at each time. And so that's this one here. And again, if the labels are represented as a one hot, one hot manner, then the KL divergence is simply the negative of the log probability of the label at each time. So this is the derivative divergences whose derivative is going to be back propagated. And of this, if I compute the derivative of this divergence with respect to Y9, then you don't have to consider all of these other elements, right? The only contribution of Y9 to the total divergence is the local divergence here, which is going to be minus log of Y9 at time nine. That makes sense? Good, thank you. And that's what will be back propagated. So now, the problem, of course, is that if, you know, we know how to deal with it. This is just your regular recurrent network. Uh, so, Kirvarash, uh, now we're not, we're not waiting anything because we are assuming that the divergence is just, is just a direct sum. The, uh, the uh, we're just smearing the labels. We're just assuming that the divergence is a direct sum. You could weight it, but we don't usually. What would the weights be? Well, you know, that's an additional problem we don't want to deal with because we have a bigger problem. And the bigger problem is that this timing information is generally not provided. If you look at any speech recognition data, for instance, or if you look at opti op optical character recognition data, which is another situation where these models easily apply, you're going to have a sequence of inputs and you're going to say, here is this recording. This recording is hello world. Uh, nobody is actually going to tell you uh, this is where the sound her ends, this is where the sound a ends, and so on. So the label information that you get doesn't have timing information. And that's a challenge. If somebody gave us timing of this kind, we know that we can just smear the labels out. And we know how to compute the divergence. And once you know how to compute the divergence, you know how to perform backdrop. But if the timing is not given, how do you compute the divergence? So we know how to train if the alignment is provided. The problem is that the alignment is generally not provided. So there are a couple of different solutions. One is I can guess the alignment. I can say, here's where I think the sound burr should have ended. Here's where I think the sound er should have ended and so on. Or I can consider all possible alignments, which is to say, you know, there are a large number of ways of aligning this, this label sequence to this input. I'm going to consider them all. Now, let's look at the first solution. How we can do, uh, how we can train the model when we use guessing the alignment as our strategy. So here's what we would do. Say I'm given the input and I'm told that the input is the word, the label is the sound beefy. So that sound consists of four phonemes, b, e, f, and e. So I could just guess that b ends at time one, e ends at time four, f ends at time eight, and e ends at the next second, e ends at time nine. So then I could, of course, smear the label as labels as before. And then I can use this guessed alignment to compute my divergence and train my model. How do I guess this alignment? Now, I could randomly guess it, or I could do something smarter. I could start off with an initial guess for the alignment, train some models with it. Now, the models will presumably not be completely random. They will have some information about, uh, about uh, the problem in them by this point. I can use these models re-estimate the alignment and then use the re-estimated alignment to update the models yet again. And then I can use the updated models to go back and re-estimate the alignment yet again and repeat this process. That makes sense? Yes or no? Guys, uh, if 
at least give me a thumbs up if it made sense so I can see. What does re-estimate mean? So I have only two responses. Is the class awake even? I'll assume it is. <laughs> Barely, all right. I can wait for a few <laughs> thumbs ups to see the responses. Yes, <laughs> all right. <laughs> okay. So, Kirvraj, uh, I'll just answer what, to answer what re-estimate means, I have to first explain what estimate means. So that's what we're going to do, right? What exactly do we mean by re-estimating the alignment for each training instance? Now, again, what is an alignment? An alignment tells us which portion of the input aligns to what symbol in the sequence. So these are all different alignments of but to the input, right? But the alignment can also be thought of as uh, basically a time synchronous sequence where within each, within the span of each symbol, I just repeat the symbol. We do this for training anyway, right? So an alignment can be thought of as a repetition of symbols, which basically makes this order aligned, but, you know, but not synchronous, time asynchronous sequence to a time synchronous sequence. Again, notice the specialty of this kind of data. The output is order aligned, meaning the bur occurs before R, which means the portion of the input that corresponds to bur occurs before the portion of the input that corresponds to R. But it's not time synchronous. You don't have one output for every input. The process of alignment and then filling in these gaps by repetition basically converts this order aligned but time asynchronous label sequence to a time synchronous sequence. And so the alignment can actually be represented as a repetition of symbols in this manner. And so this repeat the modified sequence that you get by repeating the sequence is now time aligned. I can think of this as an expansion of the original sequence. So I can think of this sequence as a compressed sequence. It's shorter than the input. And if I have the timing, then I can repeat each of the symbols and make it time synchronous. And so I can call this an expansion of the compressed sequence. And so we have the situation where a single compressed sequence can be expanded into many different time synchronous sequences depending on the alignment. And so also you can have many different time synchronous sequences which can all be compressed to the same compressed sequence. So did the concepts of alignment, expansion and compression make sense to you guys? Yes or no? I have one yes, okay, thank you. So, what is our problem? Our problem is uh, we want to find the alignment. You are given an unaligned k length compressed symbol sequence where the input the in, and the input length is n, n is typically great, greater than k. So, we want this problem of estimating an alignment is we want to find the most likely time synchronous symbol sequence given the compressed symbol sequence and the input. So we want to find the time synchronous symbol sequence that when compressed gives you this compressed symbol sequence. So here's a third poll. Harshit, can you put up the third poll? Can you guys see the poll? Yeah.
Okay, five seconds, guys. All right, let me stop this. So, can anyone tell me if this first statement is correct? True or false, true. Second one. Third. Fourth. And the fifth. Right. So an order synchronous symbol sequence that's shorter than the input can be aligned to the input by repeating symbols until the extended sequence is exactly as long as the input. The alignment of an order synchronous sequence to an input is a time synchronous sequence, right? And the symbol sequence that's time synchronous with an input can be compressed to a shorter order synchronous input by eliminating repetitions. And so or order synchronous symbol sequences that are shorter than the input are essentially compressed symbol sequence. There are multiple mappings between compressed and expanded sequences. So let's go back to our problem. Here's the actual output of the network. It has produced a probability, uh, a, a vector of probabilities at every time. I can think of this entire thing as a probability table where each column uh, Yes, Karthik, we are. So we'll get to that. So I can think of this as a, as a uh, probability table where each column is the vector of probabilities of outputs or of the uh, symbols at a time. Now, I'm, I'm given the symbol sequence. I'm told, for example, that this, this input corresponds to the, uh, the word B feet. And so I want to find the time synchronous sequence, which, uh, which the most probable time synchronous sequence for B feet. Now let's assume that I have a current model that I can actually give me this probability table. Now, one way to try to find this alignment is to simply pick the most likely symbol at each time. But then if I simply pick the most likely symbol at each time, which will it give me the actual training label sequence? Will it? So for example, let's say I'm given an input sequence and I know that this is the, uh, this is the word B phi. If I just pick the most and I have a current model, then I'm going to get a vector of probabilities at each time. If I just pick the most likely phoneme at each time, will this correspond to B phi? Guys? No, right? So, so that's because you may get phonemes which are not even in B phi, right? So what's one, one possible solution? Let's just block out everything that is not in my uh, training symbol sequence. So it's not B or E or F. So in this probability table, I blocked out all the remaining rows. If I block them out now, if I just went and picked the most likely symbol at each time, amongst the things that are not blocked out, would this correspond to B phi? Would it? Guys? Okay. This business of blocking out first means that you can think of it equivalently as pulling out the rows B, E, and F and making a separate table on top. And so picking the most likely, uh, now this only assures us that the whatever symbols are produced are correct. But if I just pick the most likely symbol at each time, there's no guarantee that this is going to be beefy, right? It could be in this case, b, e, f, b, f, e. Just picking the most likely one uh, from this simply, Restricting the table is not enough. I can't just pick the most likely one, right? So is this problem clear? Ankush, did this answer your question? At least in... Um, I'm still not sure that for very large sequences, 
will this work or not because all phonemes can occur all phonemes this is you're going to have all phonemes what it every phone so you're going to get the probability for every phoneme at each time anyway right but the length of the sequence is kind of not relevant uh the question is this is or this is not sufficient even for small phonemes right and um, for small sequences yeah so can so does everybody see that this is insufficient yes or no so can someone suggest what else we can do to improve matters any suggestions okay let me give you the answer right constrain the transitions that that can be made yes blessed and so here's how we can do it instead of just pulling out just b e and f from my table i'm actually going to list out all the symbols in my target in this manner so in this case my example was b f so b e f and e and i'm going to pull out these four rows from my probability table and my my reduced table is going to be of this form where i'm going to have one and row corresponding to each of the symbols in my training instance so in this example it's the word b f e has occurred twice so as a result i'm going to actually have two copies of the row for e this is going to be the new table that i construct from the entire table that the network computed and now when i have a table of this kind observe that if a symbol occurs multiple times first we are going to repeat the probability rows once at each location and then in this table if i think if i draw a path through this table from any point to any point right so let me just see if i can change my pointer so if i draw a path through this at table so long as my path comes starts from what happened to my pointer for some reason my pen is not working let me use the mouse so yes second guys So, so so long as I can stop anything, if I consider any path that goes from here all the way to this point, I think this is not working. Let me just use the other pointer, right? Anything that goes from here all the way to here. And if I just constrain myself saying that when I take a path through this table from the top to the bottom, at any point I can only go right or go down one step. then a path through the table is always going to be an alignment of b f to the input can you see that over here that makes sense guys right okay and so that's what we are going to do we are going to why is this now not working this is most annoying this now my mouse is not working so i can think of the table in terms of a graph i can convert this table to a graph by drawing edges of this kind where i uh draw an, draw edges from each box in the table to the same you know the same box in the next column or a box one row down in the next column 
So only these two kinds of arrows are allowed. And so if I draw these arrows, I get a graph. And now if I say that uh, I uh, am only allowed to, I must find a path from this top left corner node to the bottom right corner node, then any path through this graph, which goes from the top left corner to the bottom right corner is going to be an alignment of B phi to the input. That makes sense. So Kirbaraj, I'm assuming that this B phi is, is your label sequence that's given to you, right? So did this graph make sense to you guys? And the fact that a path through it is going to be a valid alignment. What about the rest of you? Okay. okay, so then this means that if I want to find the most likely alignment of my input to of, my, of this label sequence to the input, all I want to find is the path through this graph that has the highest probability. So first we begin to assign probabilities. And the way we do it is that we're going to wait. The, the nodes in the graph are just these probabilities. And so each of the nodes in the graph is going to be the probabilities that we have been that we have read off the probability table output by the network. The edges in the graph all have uh, they, they, they are just telling you how, how you can transition. So we're going to assign a probability of one to every edge. Now the probability of any, any path through this graph is simply going to be the product of the probabilities of the individual nodes in the graph uh, in the path. So over here, the probability of the path shown by the sequence of blue boxes is going to be the probability of B at time zero. So this Y superscript B subscript zero is basically the probability assigned to the symbol B at time zero by the network. So the probability of this path is going to be the probability of B at time zero times the probability of B at time one times the probability of E at time two times the probability of E at time three times the probability of F at time four. So this is going to be the probability of this uh, this uh, short path. And so the probability of any path from the top left corner to the bottom right corner is going to be the product of the probabilities of all the nodes in that path. And so now, if I want to find the most likely alignment of the symbol sequence to the input, I want to find the path through this graph that has the highest probability. Did that make sense? So, so Ben, I'm assuming that this is the entire symbol sequence for now. If you want to deal with messages and such like, uh, we'll get to that later. We can talk, take that offline, but I'm assuming that when you're given the symbol sequence, you have all, you know, if I'm say, if you're told it's hello world, then it's basically, here I'm using phonemes, but these could be words since it's hello followed by word. But did this setting make sense? Right. So, okay. Our problem then is that of finding the most probable path from source to sync using any algorithm. And I'm sure most of you, once I set things up in this manner, most of you can think of uh, uh, shortest path algorithms and other like Dijkstra's algorithm or the Viterbi algorithm, uh, which can be used to find this. So for those of you who do not know such algorithms, let's go through a simple one, which is the so-called Viterbi algorithm. Now the Viterbi algorithm is based on a very simple principle. If I want to find the best path starting from the top left node to this red node. Now observe that the red node has only two parents, right? 
because you only allow horizontal arrows and edges going one step down diagonally. So this can either have come from, from the same row at the previous time or the previous row at the previous time. Now, the best path to this node must be an extension of either the best path to the blue node here or the best path to the green node here. It cannot be an extension of the second best path to the blue node because the second best path is already scoring lower than the best path. And so extended it, extending it is not going to make its probability greater than that of the best path, right? So the best path to the red node is an extension of one of these two, the best path to the blue node here or the best path to the green node here. That makes sense? Yes, no? Okay, so that's a very simple algorithm. That's all I have to do, right? What I will do is that for every node, I'm going to check all of its parents and find out which parent had the best path probability. That is going to be my, you know, so that I know that the best path to this node must be an extension of the parent that had the highest, most probable best path. And so if the blue path over here, if the best path to this blue node over here had a higher probability than the best path to the green node over here, then extending the green node to this guy is going to give me an overall path that has a lower probability than simply extending the blue node. So I know that the best path to this node must come from the best parent, it would, which in this example would be the blue node. So uh, the uh, simple algorithm is, the algorithm is simple, it's like so. Uh, here I'm using this notation Y subscript T superscript S of R. R is the row number, S of R is the symbol. So S of zero is B, S of one is E, S of F is two is F, S of three is E again, right? and t is time. So y subscript t superscript s of r is the probability assigned to the rth symbol at time t by the network. So for example, y uh, t e, right? So for example, this, this I mean, it's, it's complicated notation, but it's basically giving you these things. This, for instance, is the probability assigned to the symbol e at time two by the node. Right now, using this, here's what the algorithm is going to look like. At the very first time, I know that the first symbol must be this guy. So the best path probability to this node is simply y zero b. There are no best paths to any of these nodes. So the best path probabilities to all of these other nodes is zero. So the best parent for this guy, there's no parent, there's no node before this one. So the, the best parent, the best path parent. So this node is just a num, right? Then I can take a step forward to the next time. Let's consider the first node. For the first node, there's only one parent. So I can immediately say that for the first node, the best parent is this guy. And the best path probability to this node is the best path probability to the parent times the probability of this node. Now, if I consider the second node, the second node has two parents. It could have either come from here or from here. And clearly, since this has zero probability, the best parent for this node is the one up here. So I can keep track and say that keep track of the best parent and I and uh, store the information that the best parent for this node was this one here. And the best path probability to this node is simply going to be the probability of this node times the probability of this node. That makes sense? Yes or no? What about the rest of you guys? Right. And of course, for the remaining two, both parents are impossible. So the, so the best path probabilities to these two nodes is going to be zero. And now I can repeat the same logic for every subsequent row. row. Here, for example, 
the best parent for this guy is just this one. So I can just keep track of the information that this is the best parent and the best path probability is the best path probability of the best parent times the node prob. And for these two guys, each of them has two parents. For each of them, I can pick the best, the highest, the best parent, which is the parent with the highest best path score. And then just store a pointer to the best parent and compute the best path score to the node itself, which is the probability, best path probability to the best parent times the probability of the node. So here's the entire algorithm. I'm going to go through time. At each time, there are two, only two choices for the best parent. It's either the, uh, just shown on this figure, right? So at each time, there are only two probabilities for the best parent. It's either the L my, for any symbol in the Lth row, the, the parent is either the L minus one symbol at the previous time or the Lth symbol at the previous time. We determine which of those has the higher best path score. And then once we determine that, we store that information. We say the best parent for this guy here, for example, is L minus one. And then the best path score to this node is simply going to be the best path score to the best parent times the node probability itself. I can simply use this logic and compute the best path scores for all of the nodes in this column. I can use those to compute the best path scores for all of the nodes in this column, which I can now use to compute the best path scores for all of the nodes in this column and, and so on till I get to the final input. At the final input, now by the time I get here, I have the best path scores from the starting node to every single node in the graph. But I know that the final path, node in the path must be this one, so I can ignore all the rest of these guys. And in the process of computing the best path score to each node, I also kept track of the best parent for each node. So I know the best parent for this guy. So that's this one. But I know the best parent for this guy. So that's this one. And so I know, and I know the best parent for this guy, which is this one. And so I can track my way back and find the best path through the entire graph. And that's going to give me the most likely alignment of my input to the symbol sequence as computed using the current neural network. Did this make sense? Yes, no. Any questions? Questions, guys? No. Okay. There's a poll. Ashit, can you put up poll four? Okay, 10 seconds, guys. All right, let's stop. So is this first statement true or false? Second one.
थर्ड परफेक्ट राइट सो बेटर बी अलाइनमेंट फाइंड्स द मोस्ट प्रोबेबल अलाइनमेंट ऑफ द कंप्रेस्ड ऑर्डर सिंक्रोनस सीक्वेंस टू एन इनपुट इट्स रन ऑन अ टेबल ऑफ प्रोबेबिलिटीज कंस्ट्रक्टेड फॉर द कंप्रेस्ड सीक्वेंस विथ वन रो फॉर ईच सिंबल इन द सीक्वेंस derived from the probability gen table generated by the uh, from the output of the recurrent network and it reflects the most probable symbol from each column of this table no this it does not you have to find the most likely path so i have some pseudo code for it i'll skip that but then what we have at the end of it is that we have an alignment of the input to the symbol sequence and now i can use this alignment as my target labels and now that i have this alignment i can now compute a divergence which is the sum of the divergences at individual instances and i can now train the network for this alignment now here this is what it's going to be if this was my best path this was the alignment that was given to me so the divergence that i get if i use the kullback leibler divergence as my divergence it's going to be the sum over all time of the kl divergences at each of the outputs so it's going to be the sum over all time of the kl divergence divergence between the output at time t and the best path symbol at time t so again this kl divergence we just we know is simply the negative of the log of the probability assigned to the symbol which is going to be log of y of the best path symbol at time t right the probability assigned to the best path symbol at time t now if i take the gradient of this divergence with respect to the tth output vector then i only need to consider the divergence computed at time t because this is an additive contribution and we know from the past that the divergence of the scale the, the the derivative of the kl divergence is simply going to be the, the uh, probabilities uh, a vector of zeros except at the component corresponding to the target symbol and that entry is going to be minus 1 over the the probability assigned to the target symbol we've seen this in previous classes so remember this probability it's going to feature again in the next class and so the derivative of the divergence for this aligned symbol sequence with respect to the uh, output of the network at any given time is simply going to be the uh, derivative for the the vector a uh, vector of this kind with zeros assigned to all components except the one component corresponding to the probability assigned to this target symbol and that one component is going to be minus 1 over the probability assigned to the symbol again we can see that this derivative uh it actually encourages because this the sign is negative it encourages y to increase so gradient descent using this derivative is going to try to increase the probability of the target symbol at each time so that makes sense yeah okay so answering your question kirbaraj here's what we're going to do the problem is the alignment may be wrong right because if your model is crappy the alignment is going to be crappy what we are assuming is that in general the alignment is more right than wrong so in the worst case it's going to be random but if you got a few things right you're still going to get a model which learned something and then you use that model to update the alignment and the new alignment is going to be better and the reason it's going to be better is that we have the sequentiality constraint the burr must come before e the first phoneme must be burr the last phoneme must be e and so on right and so here is the overall training procedure you're going to initialize the alignment somehow randomly uniformly whatever train model 
with the alignments, train a model with alignments. Then use that model to realign each of the training instances. I'm still calling this decoding, but it's constraint decoding. You're given the compressed symbol sequence, you're finding the alignment, right? And so you're going to be realigning the training data using this model. And then once you realign the training data, you can go back and retrain, update your models and repeat this process until convergence. That makes sense to you guys? So what about the rest of you? Kripa, what about you? Perfect. And so there are different ways of doing it. You could use this, you could realign the entire training data and then update your model or make alignment part, part of the SGP process. And it's all very fun, right? So this algorithm will actually work if you have large amounts of training data. It's efficient and uh, uh, you know very simple to implement because the alignment algorithm is so simple. The problem is that it's heavily dependent on the initial alignment. If your initial alignment is crappy, then, then the models you train will be poor. The updated alignment is going to be crappy and the entire algorithm is very quickly going to uh, converge into a very poor local optimum. So this, while this procedure would work very nicely, it has a challenge. It's prone to local optimum. There's an alternate solution, which is to not commit to any single alignment during any pass of training. So that would be training without explicit alignment. Uh, it's called connectionist temporal classification. And we're going to cover this and how we can deal with null symbols that handle repetitions of symbols in the next class. Let's do it. So we'll stop right here and I'll take any questions. Any questions? So Harshit, please stop the recording. Uh, professor, I have one question. Yes. 